Welcome to Managing School at Home. My name is Jess and I'm with the Massey Foundation and we are pleased to collaborate with the Stanford Down Syndrome Research Center to be able to bring you today's virtual event with Professor Chris Lemons of Stanford Graduate School of Education. You'll be joined by Denise Pope um, for the Q&A after the presentation is over. So now we'd like to uh, welcome Professor Chris Lemons to join us on the screen. Hello everyone. My name is Chris Lemons. I'm an associate professor in the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University. So I am here today um, to present a webinar called Managing School at Home. Um, I'm very glad that you're here. I have been a special education teacher um, before I was a faculty member and currently I do. I've spent a little more than a decade doing research um, working on improving literacy outcomes for students with Down syndrome and students with other intellectual and developmental disabilities. And so um, today I hope to give you some tips at managing the situation that you're in. A little later on, my colleague Denise Pope is going to be joining us. She is a senior lecturer here at Stanford. She's also the co-founder of Challenge Success, a nonprofit organization, and she's been a teacher before. And she'll join us with some additional advice um, a little bit later. And just like many of you are managing school at home, I'm managing presenting at home. So um, I do apologize for wind noise, bird noise, dog noise, and all of that other stuff. Okay, so first I just want to say thank you all for everything that you're doing. I know this is really an unprecedented, challenging time. And so I know that parents, teachers, and all of the other supporters are working really, really hard in this time to positively support our students with Down syndrome and homeschooling or schooling at home. So I thank you for all of your efforts you're putting in right now. And I want to just remind everyone, which I think is important to do in this current time, that self-care is really important right now. And if you would like some tips for reminders and things that you can do for self-care, I encourage you to check out the link below. As a reminder, I will be sending or I will include a QR code at the end of this presenta presentation where you can scan it with your phone camera and you'll download the PowerPoint so you can get these links easily. Jessamy will also be sending this, um, the slides out. And speaking of Jessamy, I also wanna thank the Matthew Foundation for supporting this um, webinar. And then another reminder that there are many community members with less resources. Um, probably many of those families would not have the time to be on a webinar right now. And these families and schools also need our help. And so I encourage all of us to do as much as we can for these families and to pay it for them. So an overview of where I'm going, um, I'm gonna provide some thoughts on and tips for managing school at home, provide you a little bit of an update on IDEA and the CARES Act. Then I'm gonna go over a handful of resources that you may find useful either for you, if you're a parent, or if you're a teacher, or if you're a parent to share with your child's teacher. And then we're gonna jump into the Q&A session. So this is kind of our current reality. I think it's really useful to continue to remind ourselves that we are in a national pandemic, um, a worldwide pandemic, a place that most of us in our lifetimes have not seen anything this disrupting. And so I think kind of having that reality check that this is a very unusual time is important to kind of reflect on as we move forward through this talk. And for any of you who are in a situation of this poor mother possum, um, I think a lot of us really feel your pain. So a few thoughts. I think all of us in many ways are feeling like we're drinking from the fire hose right now. I think for parents who are attempting to do schooling at home, this is even even more water coming out of that fire hose. And so we can probably identify with the person um, in this picture below. And I think it's useful to remember this is not home school right now. Um, right now, the priority should be physical and mental health and safety. And we're not asking families to replicate or duplicate the full school day in your house. Um, right now, the physical and mental health and safety of you your family and your friends and your community all should be a priority. And right now, um, for the short term, and by short term, I mean the rest of this academic year through the spring, if that's all that you can focus on right now, that is fine. I think it's important to remember the PDF. Um, you can get more information on these tips at challengesuccess.org, the link below. The PDF stands for Playtime, 
downtime and family time. And all of those things are really critical right now. And they're important things to be doing. And they're important to spend time on those things and prioritizing them. For many of our older students, middle school and high school students, also staying really connected with friends and peers is key. And so using things like Zoom and connecting with friends can be helpful. Functional skills, chores, helping community members, these are also great uses of time. And so all of those things I just mentioned are learning opportunities. And so I think sometimes when we're thinking about schooling at home, we think a lot about you know, typical reading, math, writing, social studies, science, but all of the other things that I just mentioned are also critical learning um, opportunities. And so those are important to do as well. And sometimes they may be easier to prioritize and do than some of the academics. If you are in a situation, however, that you can do more and you can manage school or some kind of learning opportunities at home, hopefully in this presentation, um, we will share some tips and resources that you may find to be useful. So now I'm going to jump into the tip section. So um, in terms of tips, we know whenever we're setting up instructional routines at school, that structure and routine are very important. So the more that you can do to make the academic activities that you're doing at home to be predictable, um, to be scheduled, to have a routine, the more successful they will likely be for students, um, particularly students with Down syndrome or other disabilities. I think it's really useful as a parent, um, as you're trying to jump in and get started, that starting small probably makes the most sense. And when I say starting small, I think you know, doing maybe as little as 15 minutes three times a day or three times a week could be a good jumping in point. You know, so do what's manageable for you. Start in a place that you think you can be successful and then add on to that as you go. Using a visual schedule can really help. There are tips below the link at the bottom how to develop one of these, but for um, students in special education classes, we use these a lot because it provides predictability and structure. And so you can see on the screen, uh, we often call these first then boards. So first you're going to do your desk work, then you get to play with toys. First you're going to do circle time, next you're going to do desk work, then you get Play-Doh. And for older learners, um, if this looks kind of young for the child or adolescent that you're working with, even just a checklist as words or um, you know, more mature looking pictures would be appropriate. But it's an idea that gives a student an idea of how many tasks they're going to be done, how many tasks they're going to do before they're finished. And so we also use preferred activities as reinforcers. So you can see at the end of that first end strip, there is something fun that's gonna happen. And so we know that work is gonna occur, but I'm gonna get something that I want at the end. And then using choice for that preferred activity is also really important. So before you get started, let your child or adolescent know we're going to do some work, but after um, we do this work, you're going to get either iPad, 15 minutes and a favorite movie or a favorite book, and let the student choose what reinforcer they're going to get at the end of that period of work. And then that is the icon that goes on the first stand board. The activities that you should do um, should be brief and fun. I think right now it really is important to Make sure that as you're doing school activities at home, that you keep those activities manageable, enjoyable, um, and enjoyable for both the student or the child and for you as the adult who's working to manage that. And then involving multiple family members, um, peers, siblings, um, this adds some variability and can also offer additional support um, for the adults who are having to manage at this point. Many of you may be in a point that you are um, seeing some challenging behavior as you're trying to um, focus on academics or schoolwork. Um, your son or daughter may not be thinking that is exactly what he or she wants to do at this point in time. So some of you may be managing challenging behavior and need some additional supports. And I know as a special ed teacher, managing challenging behavior was something I spent a great deal of my time on. So I'm really excited to share with you these resources. This is from my colleague, Erin Barton at Vanderbilt University. Um, her lab has many great resources to provide parents with simple visuals that can help you with some strategies to manage challenging behavior. So Erin's strategies focus on preventing challenging behavior, teaching, and teaching students new response strategies. So as an example, 
This is a visual of setting clear behavioral expectations. And you can see in this visual, Aaron does a great job of setting it up in a way that's very simple, usually one page, that you can kind of be reminded of some ways that you can work with your child. So here you can see, starting on the left, that we want parents to state behavior expectations positively. So for example, saying use walking feet instead of no running. We want parents to create a visual for each expected behavior and post them around your home and refer to them often, just as frequent reminders, both for you and your child. Reviewing the expectations daily and providing examples and non-examples of the expected behavior could be really helpful. And then you're gonna model and practice expectations with your child using consistent language. One of the things that we work really hard in teacher preparation programs is to work with our teachers to reduce the number of words that they're saying and to increase the consistency of the words. So if you use shorter sentences and use the same sentence or direction over and over, it makes it easier for your child to understand. And then we wanna make sure that we're providing positive descriptive feedback often to increase the likelihood of the behavior in the future. If you would like some additional resources after you've looked at Aaron's website, um, we have developed some additional behavior modules that I'm sharing with you on the next few slides. These behavior modules were developed as part of a research project that I'm running both at Vanderbilt University and here at Stanford now. We are training paraprofessionals to deliver reading and math intervention for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities in grades kindergarten through eighth grade. You can learn more about the project at the link below if you would like. But these modules are designed to enhance the skills of paraprofessionals related to behavior management. And in preparing for this webinar, we were kind of asked if we could do a quick response and provide some resources that may be useful for parents and these modules are something that we had available. They're targeted for paraprofessionals, but they're short, brief, they have videos and some additional resources within them. And I think they may be useful for parents um, during schooling at home. And I do wanna note that each one of these has a Spark connection that is related to the reading intervention that we're doing as part of the research study. And so these likely will not be as directly applicable to you as a parent. And so you might um, just wanna skip over that ending component of each module. And then I also wanna just note that these are a lot. And so I really um, struggled between how many resources I would provide on this webinar versus how limited information I would share because I don't want you as a parent to feel overwhelmed that you have to go through all of the things that are provided here. I know parents and teachers are being overwhelmed right now with a lot of resources. So I think it's just a reminder that it's not the expectation that you duplicate school, but hopefully the resources that are shared, you can use some of them if, they, if you think they will be helpful. And again, yeah, I'm providing these because many families have asked for them. And so here are the links to the modules, but in terms of the topics for the behavior modules, there are five of them where we review teaching behavioral expectations and pre-correction, setting up students for success with behavior specific praise, using visual schedules and choice making again, using token systems, and then providing some strategies for fading or intensifying behavior supports as you go. Now, as I said at the beginning, my expertise and my research over the last decade is really focused on reading. So it's probably no surprise that I'm gonna suggest that if you are doing academics at home, that reading is the best place to start. And so I just wanted to give you a few tips on that. So one of the best ways that you can spend time is conducting either read alouds where either you as the adult or parent or older siblings read text aloud to students whether you sit and read together, or you support independent reading. All of these are excellent ways to focus on academics. I think it is a good reminder to not overdo it. You really want to keep reading time with you fun. And I think that in some of our research studies, I have had um, experience where parents decided they really wanted to do the reading activities multiple times in the day, and it for some children, they then decide they really don't want to engage with that reading instruction anymore because it was overdone. So 
be mindful of your child's response. And if you're doing activities and it stops being fun, pause, do something else, and come back to it later. I think as parents at home in this time, spending more time on increased access to literature is important. So those read-alouds, discussion of stories, um, even you know reading text that your child may not be able to read independently on her or his own, but reading it aloud and talking about that builds vocabulary knowledge and content knowledge. Those are important things to be doing. For more basic skills like direct instruction of letter sound knowledge and those types of skills, often your role should be more review than primary instruction. And if you'd like to learn more about um, top 10 tips on teaching reading to students with intellectual disability, I encourage you to click on the link below. It's a podcast that I gave a couple of years ago related to an article that we had published in Teaching Exceptional Children. So I wanted to share this resource with you. This is a curriculum called Friends on the Block. Um, it's an early reading intervention that is an evidence-based program developed for students with intellectual and developmental disabilities. It was designed by colleagues at Southern Methodist University, um, Jill Lohr, Jennifer Cheatham, and Stephanie Alateva. And the great thing about this program is um, it provides textbooks that have one component that the parent or adult reads and another section of the text that the child reads. And so it's able to, doing this makes the books highly engaging and much more complex than many early reading books. And so right now, Jill and her colleagues are offering people 15 free e-readers, and that is gonna go through April 30th, and you can go to the Friends on the Block website, link below, and download those 15 free books if you would like. And then if you would like to learn more just about the program in general, you can go to the blog that's um, included below. So another strategy that is really easy for parents to use at home is a strategy called dialogic reading. This is an evidence-based practice that parents can do at home. Um, it is guided by the um, word peer, which kind of gives you the idea of what the steps are in Using peer, the first thing that you do is you prompt the child to say something about the book. So for example, if you're looking at a book, there's a picture of a fire truck. You might point and say, what is this? The child would, or next you would evaluate the response. So the child is gonna say truck. And you're gonna say, you are right. So you evaluated their response. Now you're gonna expand upon it. So you're gonna say, this is a red fire truck. And then you're gonna repeat the prompt. Can you say fire trucks? The goal here is that you're trying to get the child's responses to be more complex and you're, um, in, and you're focusing on improving comprehension but also vocabulary. And you can learn much more about how to do the strategy at the link below. The types of prompts that you would use include completion, <laughs> completion prompts. So where these are mostly like including just a blank at the end of a sentence. So usually used with rhymes. So you might say the cat sat on a what? and cat sat on a hat and um, you can continue those so that the child is getting that exposure to the text. Um, there may be some re recall prompts. So can you tell me what happened to the train? Um, Open-ended questions. These often focus on the pictures. Um, so you might ask you know, about details in those pictures or to tell something about what they remember in the story. WH questions are very important. So asking who, what, where, when, why questions. And then the highest level prompt are distancing prompts. And this is where we ask students to make connections outside of the book. So we're relating something that happened in the book to everyday life or to something that's going on um, on a television show that someone's watching, a favorite character. And so it's just helping that content of the book be a little more broadly connected to life. For children and adolescents who have more advanced reading skills, um, there are a ton of great resources on the Meadows Center website. And so I really encourage you to check that out. Um, if you're looking for text to be using with students with a little more reading skill, News ELA is an excellent website. And right now they're providing free access through the academic year. And so I encourage you to sign up and download a bunch of text there if you need them. It's a really great website, I think. Um, for these more 
for older students or children with more reading skill, we really want to start focusing on fluency. So being able to read connected text, much like we would speak instead of slow and choppy comprehension. So understanding the content of what's in those texts and then increasing understanding of vocabulary words. So as you're doing the activities below, which I'll tell you about in just one second, um, we really want students to be spending most of their time reading text where they can read pretty independently with good accuracy. So text where students can read nine out of 10 words or more correctly. So some activities that you can do are repeated reading. Repeated reading is an evidence-based practice that we know really improves students' reading outcomes. And so an idea here is that you would have a student read the text for the first time. We call that a cold reading. And you might time for one to two minutes and count the number of words the child read correctly. And then you're going to provide some guided practice where you provide correction for any words that were not read correctly and provide support. Have the student read the story two, three, four times. You might highlight words that were not read correctly the first time and do some practice either on flashcards or just pointing to those words before you start. And then after the guided practice has been provided, you would do a warm read where you re-time and recount the number of words that were read correctly. And almost always the student's number of words read correctly increases. And you can put that on a little graph and students are really motivated to see that their accuracy is improving. And so it could be kind of a short, fun activity to do with the text that does have a research base behind it that it improves reading outcomes. Other activities include Get the Gist, which is a strategy where we teach students to read a section of text, either a couple of pages if the child is really young, reading first or second grade text, maybe a paragraph if they're into text that are uh, more complex. And in Get the Gist, we teach students how to identify the main idea of that paragraph, so the most important who or what, and the most important thing about that who or what. And again, on the Meadows website, there is a great little video that's about 10 minutes long and has um, worksheets that you can download to learn more about teaching getting the gist. Other activities and videos that are included on the Meadows Center website are partner reading. Uh, it gives you some guidance of when you're reading side by side with your child how you would provide ongoing feedback. It, there is also a video and handout on building academic vocabulary, how to think about which words from a story you would select and how to provide a definition that's understandable and helpful. There are, there's a video on strategies for teaching multi-syllabic words for students who are beginning to read more complicated text. And then I know many parents right now are saying that one of their concerns is just getting students motivated to engage with virtual learning. And there's also a great little video on this website about some strategies for doing that. A couple of other um, curricula, I was asked to include some additional resources for students who are a little bit older. And so I went to Twitter and asked my academic colleagues for some help here. And so one resource that's coming out of Ohio State is the Envision It curriculum. Um, it's a transition curriculum. It is um, a free evidence-based standards aligned college and career readiness curriculum for 21st century students in middle and high school. You can see the curriculum at the, by clicking on the links here. This is a pretty complex curriculum, but it may be something useful to share with your um, child's teacher if you have a student that's in that age range. And then another resource that I think looks really promising is the Magic Ladder Library. Again, you can follow the link below. But this is a reading focused curriculum and you can see that it does include lessons and stories um, for students in middle, high school and young adults. So if you have students in that age range, I encourage you to check that resource out. Two other things, um, my colleague Michael Kennedy at University of Virginia has a program called Vocab Support. These are free downloadable resources for middle school science vocabulary. And then another colleague um, who was stressing somewhat about how much time she was going to devote to providing schooling at home for her two young children shared the mysteryscience.com resource with me and she's indicated that this is something her children are currently really enjoying. And as a mom, she's enjoying the simplicity of the lessons, how engaging they are, 
and how students are learning things, but it is more fun than just sitting doing worksheets. So I encourage you to check that resource out as well. And then if you are um, interested in learning more about reading, we also have reading modules as part of Project Spark, the study I told you about before. These modules um, focus on helping paraprofessionals understand what each of these components are and then how to teach them. So we have modules on phonological awareness, um, and that's the ability to hear and manipulate the sounds in spoken language, the alphabetic principle, the idea that we match those sounds then to letters and to represent them in print, decoding, putting all those letters together um, to get the sound back out of them to make words, sight words, there are many words that you can't decode, you just have to learn by sight, and then moving into more advanced skills of vocabulary, fluency, comprehension, and writing. And I do want to, again, just put another reminder in that the expectation would not be that as a parent you watch all of these modules to become a reading teacher. But if your child's teacher is asking you to do some activities at home related to phonological awareness or decoding, reviewing that specific module might help you understand um, the activities and might actually help you deliver them in a better way. And these are the links to those modules. So if you do, to prov do decide to provide more instruction than just review or practice, um, these modules might also be helpful. So we have a series of modules on explicit instruction. So explicit instruction is systematic, direct, engaging, and su success-oriented. So it has been validated in research involving both general and special education students. And the model moves through an instructional sequence of I do. So as the adult, I model something for you the student. We do. We both do the activity together so I can provide you both that model but also support as you're doing it. And then we move to you do. First you do with a lot of guided practice and support and then moving into more independent you do. And in these modules we focus on optimizing instructional time, reviewing prior skills and knowledge, providing clear models, um, using examples and non-examples, providing guided and supported practice, eliciting responses, providing feedback, and then moving into independent practice. And here are the links for those modules. So as I end up this section of the um, presentation, I just want a few reminders that teachers are just as thrown into this as you are. I think many teachers are completely overwhelmed with trying to Zoom third graders um, in their classroom and manage their own home lives. So I think that patience and communication are both very important right now. I think just as a reminder, um, I think it's important to not try to do too much. I think this is a kind of a fine balancing point. Maybe we can discuss this further in the Q&A, but you know, there is this idea that we know students who are engaged with school have better outcomes and they are going to learn more but we're also in a kind of a crisis mode right now at trying to switch from schooling in person to schooling at home and i think that it may be useful to kind of take a breath um, look at the bigger picture and think that you know if we are in a kind of slower point for the next month or two as we recover from where we are, um, I think it's important just to highlight that focusing on that mental and physical health is really important right now and that do as much as you can, but don't be too worried if that's not a lot. And if the expectations from your school's teachers are too much for you and your family, I think it's very perfectly fine to let them know and communicate that with them. And then just keep that focus on maintaining a comfortable and happy experience as you're doing schooling at home with your child. So I'm going to shift gears just a little bit right now and talk um, about IDEA and the CARES Act. So IDEA is the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. As many of you know who've gone to IP meetings, um, it's the primary law that governs special education in the United States. And so the CARES Act, um, is a response act to the current crisis and in this act it has provided secretary devos the secretary of education 
with discretion to make recommendations for requirements of the act that could be waived for a period of time due to COVID-19. So I think for parents, there are two primary points here. Schools currently do have to provide any services that are provided to students without disabilities to those with disabilities. So um, that's important to know. But I think it's also important to realize that IDEA was not designed for this current situation. So we may need some flexibilities. The Council for Exceptional Children is the largest professional organization for special educators. And this organization has recommended to the secretary that it may be reasonable to adjust some timelines and that some flexibility may be needed in delivering a free and appropriate public education. If you would like to read their recommendations, you can click on the link below. And I think as a parent, um, also as a special educator or a researcher, you should consider contacting your congressional leaders um, and the secretary to advocate that we still maintain high protections for students with disabilities, even in this kind of chaotic time. And if you would like to submit a letter to your congressional leader, you can use the link below provided by the National Association of School Psychologists. We also need to advocate for increased funding for IDEA to support schools when we do return to in-person school. Um, you can use this link below to compose an email to your congressional members to ask for that increased funding. And then if you would like to stay up to date on what's happening with the CARES Act and other special ed um, laws, you can follow um, my friend and colleague Ned Chiel on his special ed blog um, with the address below. So now I'm gonna highlight a few resources before we jump into the Q&A session. So Stanford has um, a website, the challengesuccess.org, that again, Denise has led, and I think this team has done an excellent job of providing a lot of really useful information, really useful resources together. So I encourage you to check it out. And again, that PDF tips to kind of make sure that you're managing your sanity during this time is also included. The University of Florida has some amazing resources right now. They have this virtual teaching resource hub that includes instructional activities that you can do at home related to reading and very important managing attention and behavior. Um, I really like this resource because many parents are indicating that you know it's hard to get their child to engage with the computer or the iPad as they're trying to do their school activities. And so there are a lot of tips, tips um, in this um, part of the U University of Florida website and then the tech tools and tips are also there if you're you know, kind of challenged with technology at this point. We also have um, resources for remote learning um, that you can check out. And one thing I want to highlight here is it does include activities for intermediate grades and secondary grades. So if you have a student who's a little bit older, these might be really useful to, for you. Many of the National Down Syndrome organizations have also put together a kind of compendium of resources. And so here are a bunch of those listed here. I think it may be useful again to have a little bit of a reminder here that um, this is a lot of information. And I think a lot of people, I know a lot of my teaching friends are feeling a bit overwhelmed with the number of resources. So I encourage you just to kind of take a little bit of time, you know, maybe spend time on one website, choose a few things that look like they're going to work for you and move forward with that, but don't feel like you have to go through every single website to find the very, very best. Um, other organizations, and these are good things. Um, a couple of people have asked, like, if I as a parent want to share with my child's teacher some resources, I think these three are really good for that. Um, wide Open School, Educating All Learners, and then Distance Learning for Special Education is a Google site that people can actually contribute to. And so I encourage you to check those three out. Other centers, um, the Thai Center and the National Center on Accessible Ed Materials have some useful information. If you're looking for some activities in literacy um, or math or managing behavior to do at home, this website, the National Center on Intensive Intervention, is a really high quality um, center funded through the Office of Special Education Program. Tons of resources on their website, but these three are probably the most applicable to schooling at home. And then if you are looking at for things to share with teachers, um, the National Center on Intensive Intervention, again, has 
three courses that are pretty much full level college courses um, on reading and math, and they are excellent. They're super high quality. And so if you have a teacher, um, perhaps you have a teacher who's a first year teacher and feeling totally overwhelmed, who wants some additional professional development resource, I would highly encourage you to share that first one. The IRIS Center is one of the highest quality um, professional development websites that exist in terms of supporting students with disabilities. And so if your child's teacher is not aware of that resource, I would definitely encourage them to use that link. There are full modules on almost all components of special education, and um, it's a really great resource. And then last, um, I'm actually the principal and investigator of a program called DVI by Design. It's an Office of Special Ed Program Funded Model Demonstration Center. And in that project, what we're doing, we're working with schools, elementary and middle schools, to train general and special ed teachers to improve literacy outcomes of students with intellectual disabilities. The project currently is relatively small with three districts in Tennessee, one district in Alabama, and then we're hoping to pick up a district out here in California um, this upcoming year. But due to the crisis and kind of where we are, our project is focused on helping give more teachers access to that curriculum. So if you are the parent or a teacher of a child with an intellectual disability in elementary and middle, and you think you may want to engage with that professional development, um, please send me an email and let me know. I'll add you to the list and then we will be working on that over the summer and probably have some resources um, available in early to mid fall. So what's next? So again, here's the QR code. If you scan this with your camera phone, it will download this PowerPoint so you can get all of the, um, the links. So it's unlikely that schools are gonna return to normal this academic year. So I think just do as much as you can, or if you need to move into a closer to summer type mode, um, if that's what you and your family need, need, I think that it's okay at this point in time. And hopefully we're gonna be returning to some version of in-person school in the fall. And again, funding for IDA to support this will be very useful. Should we remain in some form of school at home in the fall? Members of my research team, many colleagues across the country are working on ways to support families and teachers. And schools are also working really hard to figure out how to improve their service delivery. So if you have thoughts or suggestions for resources that would be helpful for you, for families like you, for your child's teachers, um, if you're up for it, send me an email. My address is just chris.lemons at stanford.edu. And I would really appreciate your suggestions. I know a lot of faculty right now who are like me are trying to figure out the best way to support schools. And so if you have tips and thoughts, um, that would be great. And then you can follow me on Twitter at Team Lemon Dog for updates. I'll try to keep that Twitter account updated. And now we're going to jump into the question and answer session. So I look forward to um, your questions and the discussion. And I thank you very much. Thank you, Chris. That was a great presentation. Um, and we are also now joined uh, by Denise Pope. Dr. Pope is the senior lecturer, is a senior lecturer at Stanford Graduate School of Education. And she lectures nationally on parenting techniques and student engagement with learning. Um, so welcome and uh, we'll just get started with questions. With distance learning, most of the work needs to be either done or submitted on a computer. My daughter has weak fine motor skills and is a slow writer, so she is in front of the computer a long time. Does this amount of exposure to electronics harm her more than it does other students? And what can we do to help her? Okay, so hi Denise, it's good to see you. <laughs> I'm happy to be here. Do you, do you want me to do a take on that and then you, you weigh sure. in? Sure. So um, your daughter's experience is unusual in one sense because of her, her, her needs, but we right now are seeing a lot of students who are online way more than they're used to being online. They're in school online, they are trying to find um, social outlets online, then they are maybe game playing online. So in that sense, your daughter is not that different from a lot of the kids that we're seeing right now during COVID-19. And the message that we're giving to those folks is, a little bit more screen time during this pandemic is, is going to be normal. We want to um, 
punctuate that with lots of time where they're off screen, getting exercise, helping with chores, um, making sure that they're off screens at least an hour before bedtime because that does impact the melatonin and affect sleep. So if you can um, stick with the fact that she's going to be on screens a little bit longer, um, but do, you know, as long as you work to get her off screens periodically throughout the day, take your cue from her as to is this working or not, or is this too much in general for the math work, um, that would be uh, the best advice that we have. Chris, do you have anything to add? I think that's great. I think one thing I might add is um, thinking about whether you could ask the teacher to provide you with things that are not online or use some of the resources that I covered and just reduce the amount of time online. So I think the idea of if your daughter is sitting at a computer highly frustrated for an hour, I'm assuming there's very little academic learning going on. And I think it's that kind of whole balance of let's think of what is keeping our family life preserved and everyone's mental health in place. And do as much academics as you can to keep that happening. But if getting trapped with a computer for hours and hours is incredibly frustrating, drastically reduce that time. Um, my Down syndrome son is at the normal exit standards for reading, B level. How do I keep him from regressing? Are there any signs I should be looking for? And also, do you have any math resources you can point us to? Math is his weak point, but I'd like to help him. So I think in terms, of, I guess I'll go Denise, then you can. So in terms of keeping um, your son at his current reading level, it's just reading read more. If he is that strong of a reader, get him books and text and do shared reading, um, encourage independent reading. You know, you can do things that the number of pages you read, we put on a tally chart and every time you get to 10, you get some treat or reward. And so just to kind of encouraging frequent reading, I think is one of the top things to do. Um, and then in terms of math resources, I do think that National Center on Intensive Intervention that I provided the link in there does have some of those resources um, that are worksheets that you can download. Um, then the IRIS Center that was included in the links as well does have some modules on math content. I will say those are probably more geared towards teachers. Um, and then Sarah Powell at Austin, Texas is one of my favorite people in the whole world and she does tons of math work. So Google her name. I think her website is just sarahpowphd.com, but Google Sarah Powell, University of Texas at Austin, and she has all kinds of math resources on her website. And I'll, I'll make a plug for um, a website called Bookopolis, B-O-O-K-O-P-O-L-I-S. It's actually, um, it was started by one of the colleagues of mine at Challenge Success, but it's um, kids recommending books. And I know that um, it's kind of cool when you say, hey, a lot of kids like this. You know, a lot of kids who are your age or who have an interest in this topic like this book. And um, it, it tells a lot about the books as well. So you can kind of make sure that they're appropriate and not too racy or whatnot in there. So a uh, little plug for Bookopolis. I think you're muted. Sorry, uh, thanks. Uh, do you have any resources for children who have Down syndrome and are deaf? So I do not. That is not a population that I've worked with. Um, I'm actually not even sure if there is someone who's conducting research. If, if that person wants to send me an email directly, um, I will do some searching and see if I can find something. Um, could you spell book? Bookopolis again. Yes, I can. So it's book, B O O K, Opolis, O P O L I S. Bookopolis. Okay. Um, this comes from a dean of education in Australia. Uh, first, I've heard of the CARES Act. This seems a dangerous development. Going back to the first hour, there was an email to medical staff to remind them they were to ensure what was need to remind them they were to ensure what was needed health wise. It seems to me there could be a corollary here with education. Kids with Down 
syndrome should be provided with all the adjustments and other education requirements that they need. Is this a contentious point in the States? I'm from Australia. So I think my knowledge of this, um, it's a highly contentious um, thing in the United States because many people in the area of special ed are highly concerned that states will take advantage of this opportunity to drastically lower the amount of money they're spending on special education. So the Council for Exceptional Children, multiple schools of education, the Division of Research of CEC, um, the Case Division, which is the administrator, special ed administrators, all of these people are providing a really heavy lobbying effort to make sure that any adjustments are very minimal. And really the, the primary recommendation from this organization is we do need to be aware that some of the timelines, like having your um, assessment in 30 days or 60 days or when the next IP is held, some of those are going to be really, really hard to do in this time. So we might need to give schools some flexibility there, but I think um, much more than that, we don't want to take away. So we definitely don't want to have any waivers from Secretary DeVos that says, well, teaching kids with disabilities is hard at home, so you don't have to do as much as you are doing for your kids without disabilities. So that's really where the advocacy is going, is recognizing that this is challenging, but not taking away any of the protections that our kids have. Um, our school has mentioned that it's very important to continue to find ways for our children to have social interaction. My son who has Down syndrome has many classmates at school who are very friendly with him. They are not really his friends and therefore he has not had any Zoom play dates like his sister. He's a very social person, um, so I'm concerned that he's not getting any social interaction. I am concerned for his well-being both psychologically and losing appropriate behavior when he goes back to school. You want me to take that, Chris? So I, one thing, this is absolutely what kids are missing. Uh, is the social part of school. They're missing that more than the academic part of school. It's very natural. And you can see with your other child how important it is to have those play dates. Um, it, it is absolutely okay to write to the teacher and uh, see if there's a way to get um, email addresses, cell phone numbers, et cetera, of friends, if that's one of the reasons why he's not doing play dates, um, to try and do these video play dates, Google Hangout, Zoom, um, that would be uh, one suggestion I have. Chris, do you have more? I think that's great. I think um, one way you could also do it is I know um, I just spoke to a fourth grade teacher the other day and she's having her students actually schedule Zoom calls with one another to like read text and talk about stories. And so I think maybe that would just be one additional thing of asking the teacher if, if she could connect you with a classmate to do like a reading of a story and then you can wrap the social around that. Um, given the battles we have faced during our daughter's IEP meetings, which have resulted, have resulted in a poor relationship with their school teachers, how can we get the teachers to provide modified work? And depending on the subject, we have seen some teachers who just say there's nothing they can do to help, and others who say our daughter should be able to do the work, but she can't. This is a hard one. Denise, do you want to go or do you want me to start? Uh, you start. <laughs> it is hard. I mean, I think the, um, gosh, I really don't know if there's a great um, answer for this. The, the teacher is legally obligated to provide the services that are in the IEP. So if modifications and things are required currently, that is legally required to take place. At the same point in time, I can, well, I don't know your child's specific teacher, but I know the teachers that I've been talking with are completely and utterly overwhelmed. The, the fourth grade teacher I mentioned, she gets up at 6.30 every morning when she does schoolwork until about seven o'clock at night. And she's working really hard to make those adaptations and modifications. So um, I don't know the situation with your current teacher. I think you know, trying to have communication with the teacher, um, letting her know that you do know that legally these things are required, but also being very understanding and supportive and um, talking about ways that maybe you can do some alternative work. And I think, again, that's maybe where some of my advice in the talk about maybe not for the current next few weeks, not terribly stressing about that every single worksheet and every single assignment is done might also be helpful. But I do think it's a, I think it's a very tricky situation because for many of our students with disabilities, taking school online at home is a lot of work for the parent. And 
that's not terribly fair for a lot of people who also have to be working. So I think in the, in the short term, I think do what you can, try to have those open conversations. I think should we be in this situation again in the fall or you know, sometime in the next academic year or two, hopefully researchers and schools and parents who are giving us ideas will have some additional ideas and supports. Um, but I think it's good just not to stress out about it in the short time. Yeah, and I would just add that learning happens all the time. So even though it's not through a worksheet or through a particular thing that the school is assigning, your child is learning how you are coping positively with a pandemic. You're, they're learning how to calm themselves down when they're angry or upset because you're modeling that for them. They're learning how, when they do chores and they're learning when they're playing and when they're being social with friends online. So, um, and I say this to, to every parent, not just, just parents of kids with special needs, that, that that less is more when it comes to the actual schoolwork, in your case in particular, because it's not being modified, um, but there's plenty of learning going on that is going to reinforce the skills that the teachers wanna see happening. So even though the content learning might not be happening, the skills about asking questions and reading and um, self-regulation and how we handle problems, that's gonna go a long way. We're getting close to the end of the uh, this virtual event, but uh, let's try to take a few more questions. Uh, my son is in the transition program. What can we do to keep their work experience going? Hmm. Um, I guess I'll, I'll take a stab at this first. I, I think um, one parent has really said that they've tried to increase the complexity of chores that their children are doing around home and to obviously support that with training and coaching, maybe some of those visuals. But I mean, there are a lot of things to do around your house, I'm assuming, that are great work skills that could translate to other types of um, you know, employment in the future. So I think doing chores, thinking about ways you could do community service, you know, you could imagine, well, you're probably not supposed to go out and be close to people, but you know, things that you could um, maybe make, le make letters and mail to people in nursing homes, or you know, there are a bunch of things that can be done that take amount of time that are all work skills and so I think that would be my top advice. I would agree. Um, uh, gardening, my son learned how to mow the lawn because we no longer have a gardening service coming so you know great skills that you can teach that are a little bit more advanced um, go a long way. I am a service related, related service provider in the public school. I support intensive special day classes, nonverbal AAC users, dynamic display, et cetera. Are there any resources that would support the design of online programs for preschool through kinder age students? I am currently not aware of a resource that is specifically targeted to that population. Um, I would encourage you the three, the slide that has like um, the three organizations, like um, I can't remember the name of it now, but Learning for All, and those three, one that at the bottom one I said is a Google site, I would check out the top two because I would anticipate they may have something related to that. But I do think this population of learners is probably our biggest challenge right now. So students that um, you know you can't, they don't engage very well with the computer, and if they're using an AAC device, trying to communicate with that device through Zoom is is just really really complex. Um, if that person also wants to send me an email, I will see if I can find more information from a colleague. But I don't really have a better answer at this point. Start do one last question. Um, I feel my son is not receiving enough actual work from teachers. He is used to having an hour of science a day and now is only getting about 25 minutes total for the week. I have him doing as much of the rest of the work as I can, but it is harder to modify the standard curriculum myself. There is a lot of science learning that goes on at home, right? Even just in the garden, even with cooking, I would say instead of working to try and modify the content that's being sent home, I would work on science skills in general, um, asking good questions. How do you know when um, an answer is a good source? I don't know how old your kid is. So, um, but depending on the age of the kid, they can go and explore um, so many museums and um, NASA and the Discovery Channel. Scholastic. There's a bunch of science resources out there for kids that they might get excited about if they're able to go online or if they're able to go online with you and you can ask questions. 
but even just everyday stuff at home, plenty of science content to keep you covered. I perfectly agree. And I, the one science, the mystery science website that I provided, if your child was a little bit younger, more elementary age, um, there's some really cool experiments in there that are just fun and you're learning vocabulary, you're learning about scientific procedures and processes, and um, it's much more tolerable and enjoyable for both you and your child. Well, I want to thank both of you so much for joining us. Thank you for hosting. Okay. Thank you.